Hey, 42 here. Nobody enjoys having surgery, except maybe that woman who spent millions of dollars trying to make herself look like a cat. But on the whole, it's something we all do our best to try and avoid. But if for whatever reason we do find ourselves being wheeled into the operating theater, we should count ourselves lucky that we live in an age where anesthetics and good hygiene are both regarded as pretty essential commodities within the medical world. Because imagine, if you will, a time and place where having an operation meant being wide awake as a man wearing a blood-soaked apron hacked through your leg with a dirty saw whilst a crowd of onlookers watched you screaming in agony. That might sound like a scene from a horror film, but in fact it was very much a reality in Victorian England, where talk of potions that could put you into an unshakable sleep would have sounded like sorcery. And the idea of washing your hands before an operation was as laughable as suggesting children of six were too young to work. Operating theatres were overcrowded, stuffy, unhygienic auditoriums that were often packed with medical students, fellow surgeons, and even paying visitors, all of whom were there to witness what was practically a blood sport. These days, we expect our surgeons to take the utmost care as they jab our prone bodies with their scalpels. But in a world without anaesthetic, where every second brings the kind of agony that can push a human being to their very limits and beyond, it doesn't pay to dawdle. In fact, speed was absolutely vital to the success of each and every major procedure. The faster a surgeon could complete the task at hand, the less chance there was of their patient dying of shock or blood loss. And when it came to speed, one name stood out above all others. Robert Liston. Liston was the Usain Bolt of the 19th century medical world, known as the fastest knife in the West End. It was claimed he could amputate a limb in less than a minute. Liston was born in Scotland in 1794, where he would go on to study medicine at the University of Edinburgh. It was here he took an interest in human anatomy, and his love affair with chopping off limbs at breakneck speeds began. By the late 1820s, he'd risen through the ranks to become one of the most celebrated surgeons of his era. Liston was an imposing character, over six feet tall, with a bullish attitude that was said to strike fear into the hearts of his students. Before carrying out an amputation, he would stride across the blood-stained floors of his operating theatre, before holding his knife aloft, turning to his audience, and uttering his catchphrase. Yes, he had a catchphrase. Time me, gentlemen, time me. The audience's eyes would flit between their pocket watches and Liston as he went to work, his blood-drenched scalpel gripped between his teeth as he skillfully carved through the patient's limb with a bone saw. Of course, this hack-and-slash approach to surgery meant the occasional mishap was inevitable. And even a surgeon of Liston's calibre could be expected to have an off day every now and then. During one tear-jerking incident, he set about removing a lump from a young boy's neck, only to discover too late that it was connected to a major artery. The mishap resulted in the boy tragically bleeding to death in front of horrified onlookers. On another occasion that's also likely to bring tears to your eyes, but for entirely different reasons, he accidentally sliced off a patient's testicles whilst performing a full leg amputation. As bad as those two slip-ups were, Liston's most disastrous day at the office is widely regarded as one of the biggest surgical mishaps in history. During one of his famed lightning fast amputations, Liston not only managed to chop off his hapless patient's leg, but also a few of his assistant's fingers. In the ensuing chaos, Liston's knife accidentally slashed through an elderly spectator's coat. The man was so certain he'd been mortally wounded, he passed out and later died of shock. <laughs> 
both the patient and the assistant with the missing fingers would also die later as a result of infection, giving Liston the unwelcome distinction of accidentally killing three people during a single surgical procedure. A record which, to this day, is yet to be broken. That's not a challenge to any budding surgeons out there, by the way. And I should point out that some historians believe this story may be apocryphal. The fact that two of these deaths were caused by infection is telling. Most surgeons fail to wash their hands or their surgical instruments before performing surgery, simply believing it to be unnecessary. Surgeons in the mid 19th century had such a poor understanding of the importance of hygiene that wearing a blood soaked apron bearing the congealed gore from past operations was considered something of a badge of honour. After all, if your apron was so matted with dried blood and guts that it was able to stand up by itself, you were clearly in serious demand and had probably been hacking off body parts successfully for many years. To make matters even worse, after the traumatic experience of having something chopped off, a patient was taken to recover on an unsanitary hospital ward where their freshly festering wound was left exposed and at the mercy of nasty bacteria that happened to be knocking around with nothing better to do. As a result, gangrene and blood poisoning were both extremely common. The air of your average ward was thick with the smell of bodily fluids and rotting flesh, and bed bugs were so rife that bug destroyers were often paid more than the surgeons themselves. With such a high proportion of patients either dying during or after surgery, it was clear that something needed to be done. Liston himself was a practical man who didn't concern himself too much with the scientific side of what he did. He was the embodiment of old school blood and gut surgery. If something needed removing, he could do it fast and efficiently. And almost every time he managed to leave the patient's balls intact, exactly where they should be. But that didn't mean Liston was averse to progress. And it was two of his students, James Simpson and Joseph Lister, who would go on to have a huge impact on how surgery was performed after following in Liston's footsteps. But more on those two in a moment. If the harrowing sound of a patient screaming on the operating table was to become a thing of the past, a way of nullifying pain during surgery needed to be found. We humans have been finding new and unique ways to knock ourselves out for literally thousands of years. Opium, alcohol and cannabis have all been used to alleviate us of our senses for time immemorial. But the first reliably recorded attempt at using anesthesia specifically for surgery actually came all the way back in 1804 when Japanese surgeon Hanoka Seishu carried out a successful mastectomy with an anesthetic based on various plant extracts. But over in the West, surgeons were experimenting with more eccentric alternatives. One of the most cutting edge of which was something called mesmerism. The brainchild of a man called Franz Mesmer. Mesmer believed an invisible force flowed through all living things and that this force could be used to make people fall into a deep sleep. Whether or not he also carried a lightsaber has never been confirmed. Once in this state, it was claimed that a patient could be operated on without feeling any pain. By the way, all you etymology fans out there might like to know that mesmerism gave us the modern word mesmerize. Anyway, for a brief time, mesmerism is said to have actually yielded some positive results, and it became popular enough that it was considered by some to be a legitimate pain preventative during surgery. But Mesmer's magical force would soon have a rival that was more firmly rooted in science fact than science fiction, an organic compound known as ether. 
Ether was first touted as a possible solution to the terror of someone having to watch themselves being sliced up like a roast chicken after its ability to make people unconscious was popularized during so-called Ether frolics which were essentially public gatherings where groups of people would take turns inhaling the vapour from sweet-smelling liquid in order to knock themselves out for a bit. Which doesn't sound too dissimilar to what goes on down at my local on a Friday night. The first public use of ether as an anaesthetic was by American dentist William Morton, who used it whilst extracting a patient's tooth in 1846. It had actually been used by a surgeon named Crawford Long about four years earlier, but bizarrely, he didn't seem to think it was anything worth writing home about and failed to document his results. Although he did change his tune when other people started to take the plaudits for what he argued was his discovery. Shock! News of this miracle drug spread fast, and back in London, Robert Liston heralded a new age of surgery when he performed the world's first pain-free amputation. This landmark procedure was so successful that when the patient regained consciousness, he was unaware the operation had ever taken place. This would lead Liston to famously proclaim, this Yankee dodge beats mesmerism hollow. In other words, hypnotic mind tricks were out and ether was in. But ether was not without its drawbacks. It's highly flammable and irritates the lungs when inhaled. Although great strides had been made, there was still room for improvement. And that's where the first of Liston's students, James Simpson, comes in. Apparently, people in the 19th century really enjoyed inhaling things until they passed out. Some things never change. After a night of huffing chloroform with a couple of his mates, Simpson felt sure he discovered a much improved alternative to ether, since chloroform wasn't flammable and it didn't irritate the lungs. But its real ace in the hole was that its effects lasted longer, meaning it could be used to enable more advanced surgical procedures. I should probably mention that despite the game-changing properties of these new anaesthetics, not everyone thought the whole putting people to sleep during surgery thing was a good idea. Some surgeons believed it was necessary for patients to remain awake in order to fight for their lives, so to speak. But when global trendsetter Queen Victoria was giving chloroform during the birth of her two children, suddenly it was all the rage. And anyone who was anyone wouldn't be seen dead having surgery without it. It's amazing what a bit of celebrity endorsement can do for a product, eh? Of course, literally being seen dead was still a pretty high probability. Although ether and chloroform had paved the way for longer and less scream-inducing surgical procedures, there was still a small matter of dying from infection afterwards. The problem was people were yet to figure out just how exactly things like disease and infection spread. And if you don't know how something spreads, you're pretty much powerless to stop it from doing so. The most prominent hypothesis for how disease made its way into the human body was miasma theory. The idea that invisible noxious gases, or bad air, floated around waiting to be inhaled by unsuspecting victims. This bad air was believed to be emitted from decaying organic matter. And in hospitals, the only real preventative in place to stop this invisible killer was to crack open a window. We still use this technique today to great effect when someone lets rip in the car, but it's safe to say it counts for very little if you're lying in a filthy, bug-infested bed with your gaping wound wrapped in dirty bandages. Still, who doesn't enjoy a nice breeze? The idea that tiny microorganisms might be responsible for the spread of disease had been around since the late Middle Ages, but had never gained much popularity with the mighty miasma theory always reigning supreme. French microbiologist Louis Pasteur first proposed his germ theory in 1861, after he conducted experiments that suggested the fermentation of organic matter 
was caused by particles in the air and not, as miasma theory would have it, the air itself. But the idea that tiny organisms could destroy a mighty human being seemed preposterous to many, and at first Pasteur's theory was not well received. A few years later, over in Germany, another microbiologist by the name of Robert Koch was able to successfully isolate the different pathogens responsible for particular diseases. And as a result, germ theory finally started to gain real traction. The second of Liston's students, Joseph Lister, had been following these groundbreaking developments with great interest. And he began to theorize that if he could keep an operating theatre as germ-free as possible, perhaps the likelihood of infection could be decreased. He just needed to find something that was effective at killing those tiny little buggers. The solution would present itself in the most unlikely of places. The Carlisle Sewage Works. The place to go for all your sanitary needs. Lister heard from a colleague that carbolic acid was being used to control the overwhelming stench that was being emitted from the sewage works. Lister realized that in a more diluted form, carbolic acid could be used safely during surgical procedures. And so he began testing its germ-killing properties during his operations. Surgical instruments, bandages, and even his own hands were all drenched in the stuff. He even had a spray bottle handy, so the acid could continually be pumped into the air during the operation. At first, he was ridiculed for these methods, but soon the results began to speak for themselves. In just three years, he took the death rate of his patients from almost 50% down to 15. And before long, his germ-busting procedures would be implemented in hospitals around the world. These days, safer and more effective alternatives to carbolic acid and chloroform are in use. But the principles laid down by Lister and Simpson still remain in place. Hospitals today are bastions of good hygiene. Surgery is painless, at least whilst it's taking place, and operating theatres are about as sterile as we can make them, not to mention free from prying onlookers. Operations can last for hours, and in extreme cases, even several days. Something that would have been unimaginable in Robert Liston's day, where his speed was of the essence. Unfortunately, Liston would die as a result of an aneurysm at the peak of his career, just one year after he'd performed his game-changing, pain-free amputation. Tragically, this meant he would never see the huge impact that he, and this landmark operation would have, both on his students and on the medical world as a whole. Thanks for watching. Check out my new podcast, Random Interesting Facts, available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Link in the description below. Thanks.